Okay, well, Bunsen has said that from Buddhism you get the idea that there, there isn't actually a goal to life. And Donna said, well, we don't know where we're going. So in a sense, we don't know what the purpose is. So what the philosopher would add is, okay, we don't know, and, but we know that we don't know. <laughs> so I have to, first I have to make a confession, which is when I read the question, I just transformed it in my mind into what is the meaning of life. So I'll say a bit about the meaning of life and you know, connect it up to the question of purpose. Um, I told my friend Selena, who's here, that I was going to do this talk, and she suggested that I could just start off by saying, there is no meaning, <laughs> and then sit down. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I decided not to do this, because especially as a philosopher, you still have to ask the question of, what does it mean to say that there's no meaning? <laughs> and it, it seems like this is a very human thing, that we need meaning, whereas we, we have this need for meaning, we're asking questions, and in a way, purpose is you know, it's connected to that. Um, and I think this, this desire or this searching for meaning, it's something that really typifies what it is to be human. And philosophers are often trying to define the human and what it is that makes us different from other animals. And they say things like we have reason or we are self-conscious so we can reflect on our experience or that we create value, we, you know, we, we decide that things are good or bad. But another way of looking at it is that we are these meaning-creating or meaning-seeking animals. And I think this starts off very early, you know, when a child becomes sort of proficient in language, um, they very soon discover this magical word, why, that they can, you know, use to open up this whole world of meaning, you know, this, this why, 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 why. But actually the question is not just why, it's usually but why. So, you know, you have to eat your dinner, but why, you know. Um, and I think in this question there's sort of these two sides. There's the curiosity, there's the wonder at this world that's unfolding. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the why is like this machine that can open up the world in this way. But there's also the but, there's also a um, kind of an objection or a demand or a challenge that the child is making. And I think when we grow up, we, we sort of transfer that question, that childish question, into something that sounds more sophisticated and it has a broader reach, which is what is the meaning of life? Um, and I think this has these two sides as well. There's a sense that life is this amazing thing, it has so many unexpected layers to it that you discover as you, you go on living. So there's, a, there's that wonder, but there's also a kind of objection when we come up against things that we don't like or life doesn't, doesn't give us what we want or it doesn't, it doesn't meet our, our expectations, then we want to know, you know, but why? What, what's the meaning of this? And there's a fear in there as well that maybe there is no meaning or there is no purpose. Now, on the poster, you will have seen that I was described as the academic um, so I, I was thinking, well, what, what's expected of an academic, you know, what's the academic perspective on the meaning of life or the purpose of life? You might think, well, there's not much point in an academic perspective on such a question. But I think maybe the idea was that um, philosophy, when it started off, wasn't separate from religion. It wasn't separate from practices of living um, that, that we think of as religious ones or, or a philosophy of life. But then at a certain point in history, philosophy does separate off from religion and from practices of living, and it becomes academic. It becomes something that gets done in universities. And that happens at a point where there's a crisis of faith in, in religion. Um, well, this is one way of looking at it. Um, so I was thinking about that, you know, whether I was being asked to, say, present a perspective which confronts that sort of problem. And so I thought of speaking about Nietzsche, what Nietzsche has to say. He's also a philosopher that I've done a lot of work on. And he's famous for announcing the death of God. Now, he actually does this in a kind of parable. He says, there's a madman who comes into the marketplace in the morning with a lit lantern, even though it's broad daylight. And he's seeking God. He's asking, where is God? Where is God? And there are a lot of atheists uh, amongst the people in the marketplace and they laugh at him and jeer at him. And so he, he says, where is God? I will tell you. God is dead we have, and we have killed him. How could we have done this? How could, how could we have had the strength to wipe out the horizon? How could we have had the strength to, to, to drink up the sea? And the people still jeer at him, they don't understand. And then he says, then he, he throws his lantern down and it smashes into pieces. <laughs> And he says, I can see that this event has not yet arrived. It's happened, but it's still, it's still a long way off. It's still arriving. And these people, although you've done it yourselves, you, you, don't, you can't hear this message yet. You can't understand it. Now, he, he also, where he speaks about this, it's in a book of his called The Gay Science. He anticipates this passage with a, an earlier one in the book, where he says that after the Buddha died, 
there was a cave in which the shadow of the Buddha was cast for many years. I don't know, it would be interesting to have a Buddhist perspective or you know, information about this, where the story is coming from. And he says the same is true of the Christian God, because God is dead, but there will be the shadow of God that will be cast for many centuries. And we not only have to, to come to terms with the death of God, but we have to deal with the shadows as well. Now what Nietzsche thinks is the result of that is that uh, he uses the imagery of the sea, that these new seas open up and new horizons open up. So in, in his understanding of this experience, there's also these two sides. There's the side of discovery, you know, that I spoke about before, the side of, um, particularly for lovers of knowledge, he says, it, it, it opens up a new horizon, which is not necessarily a bright one, but it is a, it's, it's a cause for cheerfulness and a new likeness and a, a sense of adventure and, and, um, and seeking. But then he also speaks about this experience as a very difficult one, that we come out on this sea, we're in a little boat, and sometimes the sea is smooth and golden and, um, you know, a, a play of beauty. But other times we become aware that it's an infinite space. And we've left the light land behind. In fact, we've destroyed the land. But he says, woe betide the, the bird that beats against the, the bars of this cage, the cage of infinity. And, and feels that the la in the land there was actually more freedom, but the, the land is gone, there's, there's no more land. So, to, to conclude, I started off with this possibility of just saying there is no purpose. Now that's a kind of, I think a Zen maybe way, you know, performative way of saying there is no purpose, you know, this is frightening, we'll go into the fear and, and see what happens, you know, let it transform you. Then I talked about the, the child who's asking questions and you know, the but why, it's an irritating question and eventually, you know, the parent usually says, oh, I don't know, you know, just eat your dinner. Um, so that's another response, just to say, well, don't worry about it, you know, just get on, just live, you know, find the purpose, the meaning, just through living. But then the philosopher's response is something more like, well, I don't know, but I know that I don't know. And that makes all the difference. That opens up this field of possibility, which might be one of danger and risk, but might also bring about new uh, riches, and perhaps also riches in terms of uh, seeking truths uh, in a new way, in terms of like thinking about this as an interfaith discussion, maybe religions opening up to one another with a, a spirit of openness and discovery and searching um, that can take place because of this sense of uh, that, that we don't know and we, we know that we don't know.